you would be active within our hearts and minds as we mm. <clears throat> read Lord, an exposition of your scriptures, Father. Mm. Lord, may we not be unenlightened in our preview of them, Lord, mm. but read and, br- and uh, receive all information, mm. Lord, uh, with an inspired mind, mm. Lord, and one that applies the standards of your wisdom, mm. Lord, not merely to determine what is and is not true, Lord, as much as our desire to, Lord, uh, receive your wisdom where it can be found, mm. Lord, and to, to better understand, Lord, the, uh, your purpose that's expressed through these things, mm. Lord, how they can even further our walk in you and our own lives. Mm. I pray this in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Mm. Bless the Lord. And, um, and now the book. And I can't find it. No. <laughs> I'm so Alex- in the middle of a Alexander McLaurin. That's right. Yeah. I think we finished the second point, am I? Did we? Or we start with second point? Looks like where I'm at, at least we were starting on the second point. Okay. It's not long, so let me read that. Let me read it. Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> And then notice, still further, how such a temper and such a prayer have the effect of a hiding joy and blessing from us. Talking about Abraham's prayer for, in in the case of Ismail, okay. (laughs) This was a crisis of Abraham's whole life. It was a moment in which his hundred years nearly of patient waiting were about to be rewarded. The message which he had just received was the most lovely and gracious word that ever had come to him from the heavens, although many such a word had come. But what does he do with it? Instead of falling down before God and letting his whole heart go out in jubilant gratitude, he has nothing to say, but I would rather than that that is in another way. It is all very well to speak about the sending this air for promise. I have no pleasure in them because it means that my Ishmael is to be passed by and a shout. So the preferred joy, what the word means? Preferred. That's a strange word, never heard of that one. Sorry. Offered. Okay. Preferred. Pre-offered, no? proffered joy is a turn to ashes, and Abraham gets no good for the moment of the God's greatest blessing to him. But all the sky is darkened by mists that come out from his own heart. Brethren, you want to be miserable, pack up your own will against God. If you want to be blessed, a quince in all that he does send, in all that he has sent, I am by anticipation you know, that he will send. For depend upon it, the secret of finding some beams everything simply letting God have his own way and making your will the sounding board and the echo of his. If Abraham had done as he sought all to have done, that would have been the gladdest moment of his life. You and I can make out of our deepest sorrows the occasions of appear, though it is quite gladness. If only we had learned to say, Not my will, but thine will be done. Reminded me about Mary. The mother reminds Jesus. Mm. <clears throat> that is the talisman that turns everything into good. And it makes a sorrow forget its nature and almost approximate to Solomon joy. Three. My last word is this. God allows us 
all too well to listen to such a prayer. Abraham's passionate cry was so much empty wind that I would like a straw lead、uh, laid across the course of a expression in so far as is a power to modify the gracious person God already declared was concerned. Would it not be a miserable thing if we would deflect the solemn, loving march of the divine providence when this hard, foolish, purblind wishes for ours, and only see only the nearer end of things that have no motion of where the first end may go or what it may be? Is it not better that we should fall back upon this thought, though on the first sight it seems so as to limit the power of penitence? We know that if we ask anything according to His will, He heals us. There is nothing that would more wreck our lives than if what some people want were to be the case that God should let us have our own way and give us serpents because we ask for them, and fancied. The red eggs, or let us break our teeth upon best of stone, because, like whimpering children crying for the moon, we have asked for them under the delusion that they were bread. Leave all that in His hands, and be sure of this: that the true way to peace, to rest, to gladness, to wringing the last drop of possible sweetness out of gifts and losses. Disappointments of fruitions, it will have no will but God's will enthroned above and in our own wills. If Abraham had acquiescence, acquiescence, and submitted to Ishmael and Isaac, would have been prepared to bless his life as they stood together over his grave. And if you and I will leave God to order all our ways. And not to try to interfere with his purposes by our short-sighted dictation, all things will work together for good to us because we love God, and lovingly accept His will and His law. Because of His importunity. And the man rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. That Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, "Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessing him, for I know him, and he will command his children, his household after him." And、uh, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Then the Lord will bring upon Abraham that which He has spoken of him. And the Lord said, "Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which come to me, come unto me. And if not, I will know." And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, "Well done, O so destroyed, righteous with the wicked. Peradventure, there be fifty righteous with in the city. Well, thou also destroyed, not spares a place for the fifty righteous that are therein." And be far from thee to do this manner, to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and the righteous shall be and the wicked. And be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sins. And Abraham answered and said, "Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. 
Peru and church there shall lack a fire the fifty righteous will I teach all the city for lack of five. And he said, If I found there forty to five, I will not teach all it. And he spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure, there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty six. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure, there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it, if I found thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. But when church there shall be twenty found there, and he said, I will not destroy it for twenty sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. But when church ten shall be found there, and he said, I will not destroy it for ten sake. And the Lord went his way, as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Genesis, that is, uh, what, 18, right? So, 18 to 33, 1. The first verse of the chapter says that the Lord appeared unto Abraham. And then proceeds to tell that the three men stood over against him, thus indicating and these were collectively the manifestation of uh, Jehovah. Two of the three subsequently went towards Sodom and uh, are called angels in chapter uh, 14. One. One remained with Abraham, it is uh, dressed by him as a Lord, but the three are similarly dressed in verse 3. The inference is that Jehovah appeared not only in the one man who spake with Abraham, but also in the two who went to Sodom. In this incident, we have first God's communication of his purpose to Abraham. He was called the friend of God. And the friends confide in each other. The sacred of the Lord is with them that fear him. It is ever true when they who live in amity and communion with God thereby acquire insight into his purposes. Even in regard to public or so called political events, a man who believes in God and is a moral garment while often being dealt with a terrible sagacity, which forecasts consequences more surely than do godless politicians. In regard to one's own history, it is still more evidently true that the one way to apprehend God's purposes in it is to keep in close friendship with Him. Then we shall see the meaning, the else bewildering world of events that be able to save he that has wrought us for the self same, self same thing is God. But the reason assigned for entrusting Abraham with the knowledge of God's purpose is to be noted. It is it was because of his place as the medium of blessing to the nations. And as a lawgiver to the descendants, God that know him, that is, and lovingly brought him into close relations with himself, not for his own sake only, but much more, it might be a channel of grace to Israel and the world. His commandment to his de descendants was to lead to the worship of Jehovah and his up the upright living, and this again to their possession of the blessings promised to Abraham. Then the purpose will be aided by the knowledge of the judgment on Sodom, its source, and its cause, and therefore Abraham was admitted into the council chamber of Jehovah. The insight given to God's friends is given that they may more fully benefit the men by leading them into paths of righteousness on which alone they can be met by God's blessings.
The strongly figurative representation in verse twenty twenty one, according to which Jehovah goes down to ascertain whether the facts of Solomon's sin can respond to the report of it, belong to the early stage of Revelation and need not to surprise us, but should impress upon us the grandeur character of the divine revelation. That's you, man, calling me. Can you? Play what? Talking about the Zoom link notification. Oh, I'm giving okay. jokes. <laughs> no. Good, good. No, I'm teasing you, sir. Which would have been useless unless it has been accommodate, accommodated to the mental and the spiritual stature of its recipients. Nor should it hide from us the lofty conception of God's long suffering justice, which is presented in so childlike a form. He does not judge after the hearing of his ears, nor smite without the full knowledge of the sin. A later stage revelation puts the same thought in language less strange to us when it teaches that the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are wind. In His balances, many a false estimate, both of virtuous and vicious acts, is corrected. A retribution is always exactly adjusted to the deed. But the main importance of the incident is that it is in the wonderful picture of Abraham's intercession, which, in like manner, wills under a strangely censures, censures, what the word, censures, censures, censures representation, law of the truths of all ages. It should be noted that the divine purpose expressed in "I will go down now and see" is fulfilled in the going of the two men or angels towards Sodom. Therefore, Jehovah was in them, but he was also in the one before whom Abraham stood. The first great truth enshrined in this part of the story is that.、Uh, The friend God is compassionate, even of the sinful, and degraded. Abraham did not intercede for Lot, but for the sinners in Sodom. He had a perilous life in warfare for them.、Hmm. There seems at this stage, at least, that he missed it. Not he. He interceded for the righteous. Am I right? So sorry. <laughs> Where had he learned the supreme pity? Where but from the God with whom he lived by faith? How much more surely will real communion with Jesus lead us to look and、uh, look on all men, and especially on the wishers and the outcast, with his eyes who saw the multitudes as a sheep without a shepherd, torn, panting, scattered. Lying exhausted and defenseless, indifferent to the miseries, and impending dangers, of Christless man is impossible for any whom he calls not servants but the friends. Again, we are told the bonus of pleading, which is permitted to the friend of God, it is compatible with deepest reverence. Abraham is keenly conscious of his audacity, yet though he knows himself to be but dust and ashes, and does not stifle his conditions, his was the holy importunity which Jesus sent forth for our imitation. The word surrendered in Luke six. Eight, which is found in the New Testament, there only literally means shamelessly, shamelessness, and exactly the disposition which Abraham showed here. Not only was he persistent, but he increased his expectations with each partial granting of his prayer. The more God gives, the more does the true supplant, expect, and crave. And rightly so, for the gift to be given is infinite, 
an H D grid for possession in largest capacity so as to fit to see more, and widen desire. What contented us today should not content us tomorrow. Again, Abraham is a bold. In appealing to a law to which God is bound to conform, shall not the Judge of all the earth do right? Is often quoted with an application foreign to its true meaning. Abraham was not preaching to man trust that the most perplexing as God would be compatible for vindication if we knew all, but. He was pleading with God that his acts should be plainly accordant, accordant with the idea for justice planted by Him in us. The phrase is often used to strengthen the struggle, struggling faith that all is right, which seems the most wrong. If it be His sweet will, but it means not that such and such a thing must be right because God has done it. Or about such and such a thing, he is right. Therefore, God must do it. Of course, our conceptions of right are not the absolute measure of the one ends. The very fact which Abraham sought contrary justice is continually exemplified in providence that the righteous shall be as wicked in regard to earthly calamities affecting communities. So far, Abraham was was wrong. So far, Abraham was wrong, but the spirit's remonstrance remonstrance was a holy right.、Hmm. Interesting, huh? Again, we learn the precious lesson that the prayer for others is a real power. It does bring down blessing the word evil. Abraham did not hear pray for Lot, but yet God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Chapter fourteen twenty nine. I'm sorry, nineteen twenty nine. So then, their hand being on record in the session for him too. The unselfish desires of all others. Then they exhaled. From a human heart, under the influence of the love which Christ plants in us, to come down in blessings on others, as the moisture drawn up by the sun may descend in fructifying rain for on far-off pastures of the wilderness, we help one another when we pray for one another. The last lesson taught is that the righteous men are indeed the salt of the earth, not only preserving cities and nations from false corruption, but procuring for them false existence and、uh, probation. God holds back His judgments so long as hope of amendment survives, and will not destroy. For the tens' sake, please continue.、Mm. <clears throat> the intercourse of God and His friend, two. We have seen that the fruit of Abraham's life, I'm sorry, we have seen that the fruit of Abraham's faith is God's entrance into close covenant relations with him, or as James puts it, it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. This incident shows us the intercourse of the divine and human friends in its familiarity, mutual confidence, and power. It is a forecast of Christ's own profound teachings and his parting words in the upper chamber concerning the sweet and wondrous intercourse between the believing soul and the indwelling God. Number one. The friend of God catches a gleam of divine pity and tenderness. Abraham had no relations with the men of Sodom. Their evil ways would repel him, and he would be a stranger among them still more than among the Canaanites, whose iniquity was not yet full. But though he had no, he has no special bonds with them. He cannot but melt with tender compassion when he hears their doom. 
Communion with the very source of all gentle love has softened his heart, and he yearns over the wicked and faded city. Where else than from his heavenly friend could he have learned this sympathy? It wells up in this chapter like some sudden spring among, among solemn solitudes. The first instance of that divine charity, which is the best sign that we have been of God and have learned of him. All that the New Testament teaches of love to God as necessarily issuing in love to man, and of the true love to man as overleaping all narrow bounds of kindred, country, race, and ignoring all questions of character, and gushing forth in fullest energy towards the sinners in danger of just punishment, is here in germ. The friend of God must be the friend of men, and if they be wicked, and he sees the frightful doom which they do not see, these make his pity the deeper. Abraham does not contest the justice of the doom. He lives too near his friend not to know that sin must mean death. The effect of friendship with God is not to make men wish that there were no judgments for evildoers, but to touch their hearts with pity and to stir them into intercession and to effort for their deliverance. Number two. The friend of God has absolute trust in the rectitude of his acts. Abraham's remonstrance, if we may call it so, embodies some thoughts about the government of God and the world which we should which should be pondered. His first abrupt question, flung out without any reverential pre preface, assumes that the character of God requires that the fate of the righteous should be distinguished from that of the wicked. The very breathness of the question shows that he supposed himself to be appealing to the unelementary and indubitable law of God's dealings. The teachings of the fall and of the flood had graven deep on his conscience the truth that the same loving friend must needs deal out rewards to the good and chastisement to the bad. That was the simple faith of an early time, when problems like those which tortured the writers of the 73rd Psalm, or of Job and Ecclesiastes, had not yet disturbed the childlike trust of the friend of God, because no facts in his experience had forced them, upon, forced them on him. But the belief which was axiomatic to him, and true for his supernaturally shaped life, with its special miracles and visible divine guard, is not the ultimate and irrefragable principle which he thought it. In widespread calamities and righteous Sorry. In widespread calamities, the righteous are blended with the wicked in one bloody ruin, and it is the very misery of such judgments that often the sufferers are not the wrongdoers, but that the fathers eat the sour grapes and the children's teeth are shed, set on edge. The whirlwind of temporal judgments makes no distinctions between the dwellings of the righteous and the wicked, but levels them both. No doubt, the fact that the impending destruction was to be a direct divine interposition of a, of a punitive kind, made it more necessary that it should be confined to the actual culprits. No doubt, too, Abraham's zeal for the honor of God's government was right, but his first plea belongs to the stage of revelation at which we, he stood, not to that of the New Testament, which teaches that the eighteen on whom the tower in the Siloam fell were not sinners above all men in Jerusalem. Abraham's confidence in God's justice, not Abraham's conceptions of what that justice required, is to be imitated. A friend of God will hold fast by the faith that his way is perfect, and will cherish it even in the presence of facts more perplexing than any which met Abraham's eyes. Another assumption in his prayer is that the righteous are sources of blessing and shields for the wicked. Hmm. Has he there laid hold of a true principle? Certainly it is in it is indeed the law that every man shall bear his own burden. But that law is modified by the operation of this other, of which God's providence is full. Many a drop of blessing trickles from the wet fleece to the dry ground. Many a stroke of judgment is carried out harmlessly by the lightning conductor. Where God's friends are inextricably mixed up with evildoers, it is not rare to see diffused blessings which are destined indeed primarily for the former, to find their way to the latter. Christians are the salt of the earth in this sense too. If they have corrupt, 
that they save corrupt communities from swift, from swift destruction, and for their sakes the angels delay their blow. In the final resort, each soul must reap its own harvest from its deeds, from its own deeds. But the individualism of Christianity is not isolation. We are bound together in mysterious community. And a good man is a fountain of far-flowing good. The truest saviors of society are the servants of God. Hmm. A third principle is embodied in the solemn question. Wait, let's repeat that one. That's a really good one. The truest saviors of society, am I? The truest oh, saviors of society are the servants of God. That may be, yeah. Mm -hmm. A third principle is embodied in the solemn question. So what's the first principle? It has to be compassion, tender, am I? And mercy towards the one he intercedes. And second, maybe I'm looking through wrong direction. Second, he has to trust God's, the justice of God's judgment, am I? So. Yeah, I think this. Different Third set of principles uh, still within the second point. The way he okay. organizes things is kind of odd, but too too many readings. I lost my <laughs> my train of thought. So, so oh the so what the what the three principles here? I don't know. Okay, that's all. But the wish important to mention there. Okay, the teaching. You please continue. Let me okay. not uh, stop you. A third principle is embodied in the solemn question. Shall not the judge of all oh, the earth do Oh, there you go. The first principle. I'm sorry. I want to know. So. Um, oh, what is the first principle? I think the first principle, as it relates to the second point he's making, yeah, is the abruptness of his questioning of whether or not the righteous should be distinguished from the wicked. As mentioned near the beginning of point two. As the beginning of point two? So sorry. The second would be... the fact that in his prayer, there's an assumption that the righteous are a source of blessing and shield for the wicked. Mm. And then going into the third point here. Go ahead. I'm sorry. A third principle is embodied in the solemn question. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? This is not meant in its bearing here, as we so often hear it quoted, to silence man's questionings as to mysterious divine acts, or to warn us from applying our measures of right and wrong to these. The very opposite thought is conveyed. Can you repeat the third principle? When you read, I hardly, barely catch up the meaning. His English weird a little bit. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. A third principle <clears throat> is embodied in the solemn question, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Uh. This is not meant in its bearing here, as we so often hear it quoted, to silence man's questionings as to mysterious divine acts or to warn us from applying our measures of right and wrong to these. So why is that? To silence man's questioning, okay. Or to warn us from applying our measures, right? So the opposite thought is going to be Okay, it's God's righteous character, my character, mm -hmm. nature. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. The very opposite thought is conveyed, namely, the confidence that what God does must approve itself as just to men. He is judge of all the earth, and therefore bound by his very nature, as by his relations to men, to do nothing that cannot be pointed to as inflexibly right. Mm. If Abraham had meant what God does must needs be right, therefore crush down all questions of how it accords with thy sense of justice, <laughs> he would have been condemning his own prayer as presumptuous. Mm. And the thought would have been entirely out of place. Mm. 
but the appeal to God to vindicate his own character by doing what shall be in manifest accord with his name mm. is bold language indeed, but not too bold, because it is prompted by absolute confidence in him. God's punishments must be obviously righteous to have moral effect or to be worthy of him. Thank okay. you. I wanted to ask maybe totally other context question here. In this interchange exchange rather between a friend God and God with Abraham's appeal eventually God to change his plan almost right so mm. so how you place do you think if fitting any argument of free will and the predestination the free work <laughs> is this it just doesn't fit, right? So, yeah. I'm thinking about certain people said, God just do what he do, you know? So, yeah. no, no human elements or human agency need to be involved in the process, you know? It's just a matter, God actually wants his friends or his enabled one, poor one, to share that process, make his sentence to involve that process. So if we think justice is only done by God, even in the making and the operation of it, don't see the activation of a man's agency or partnership with man in ministering it, right? So mm -hmm. we miss the whole point. In that light, the kind of self pres presumptuous faces like a free will, a predestination, which is so confused with many philosophy and theology in his years. It's uh, basically a false construct in the sense, making sense to you, you know, so. Yeah. Because it all contingent on what a man thinks rather than what, what a God true operation look like in all men, man. So, I may be speaking a little bit in the loop or academic, but uh, you understand what mm -hmm. I'm trying to get at, am I? So, because if you use the common denominators or conclusions or argument points for between the two camps, free will versus predestination, he brings a story there. There's no way they can reconcile either, either party. So, you know, so, yeah. yeah. So, God going to do it, okay, predestined. So, then why, why Abraham changed God's decision? You know, so, if it's, it's, it's not, then, you know, man will do what he wants to do, and God, he strong agencies. Well, then why judgment eventually fall, you know, so, yeah. And why God have this process said, hey, I want to make sure that the report to me <laughs> of the sins of Sodom is right, you know, so. Is God not knowing that? He sure knows. Do he have to, like, uh, uh, detect the <laughs> solicit evidence whether the report's right or wrong? Uh, you understand my point, you yeah. know, it's a ri ridiculous thing that he don't know, right? So, in the way man thinks, or he operates. So, there's a lot of foolish uh, theological, especially in the predestination, I don't know, maybe the Catholic as well, just uh, to totally ignore it, because they think that can make a strong point of whatever the the... the the beautiful thoughts again put up about God, am I? So, mm -hmm. the inchangeability of God. In this case, God has changed. You know, so why he changed? You know, so in his uh, disposition of a particular decision. So, this is like a self contradictory because they don't necessarily know or pay a lot of attention, hold the counsel of God through man's um, enabling. And his entrustment, am I, for that involvement, man's enabling, punishes him, am I, so, is actually the whole, the whole target, why he work out history, why he create why why he give experiences, am I, so, anyway, I hope I uh, make some sense to you, yeah, so. Mm. Comments? Your mind even did it slow like a mind, so. Getting it slow, huh? This morning is slow, huh? I didn't sleep for almost three days, so. 
Less than eight hours, so. Uh, ten, less than ten. So my mind is is a slow, but I still can carry on. Hope yeah. this morning I can finish with with, with <laughs> yeah, the energy okay. with you. So, yeah. but you better charge it up. So I also I can do. <laughs> you need to give some inspiration to me. So. Yeah. What I'm stuff uh, in this conversation is try to sure. to make the mind working and understand what's really reading. Let's go through the motion. It's not good. So. Yeah. Yeah. Especially on this matter. So. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Go ahead. But true as the principle is, it needs to be guarded. Abraham himself has, is an instance that men's conceptions of right do not completely correspond to the reality. Mm. Man's conception of right, am I? So, yeah. mm. The notion of right, his, sorry, his notion of right was, in some particulars, as his life shows, imperfect, rudimentary, and far beneath New Testament ideas. Conscience needs education. The best men's conceptions of what befits divine justice are relative, progressive, and the shifting standard is no standard. It becomes, to, it becomes us to be very cautious before we say to God, this is the way, walk thou in. <laughs> yeah. Or dismiss any doctrine as untrue on the ground of its contradicting our instincts of justice. It's interesting, you know, like a father. That fits with the, mm -hmm. the idea that you're having, of, that you're sharing of certain Christian ideas as it concerns predestination is they also heavily emphasize the theme of the waywardness of man's heart and his sense of justice. So therefore, he is not in any any way uh, a fit or adequate member of any council <laughs> in any respect. And is that right? But I mean, not that they actually address uh, there being a council with God of any kind. Mm. As far as I know, I'm just saying, along with this idea of predestination, mm. there is the theme of fallen man in his incapacity, his, to, his incapacity to mm. to be part of God's a counsel. righteous mm -hmm. judge. Yeah, in yeah. the sense that he, the heart of man, as it even corrupted, says, is, yeah. is corrupted, yeah. 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 wayward in that sense. Yeah, but then the same can't claim righteousness in Christ is the word used today, right? So Through Christ. In, in Christ is we are righteous. So don't tell me we're not righteous. Yeah. <laughs> so righteousness means what? To them it's not reality, it's a notion. It's like an equation, right? So Right. The reality is that if you're righteous you have to make a righteous judgment. You know, so yeah. Go ahead. Let's see where are we are. This is huge, Noah. Yeah. Hmm? It Not seems that uh, maybe the philosophical argument a little bit, but it's a huge actually, am I, in terms mm. of how to learn God and enter his council, receive the council, process out of the council. You know, it's actually is the very thing God prefaced here, I want to share this council. Yeah. To show it to Abraham, I want to see how he works out in his own heart, am I right? So, make sense to you? Yeah. Because he's going to be a father of many nations, you know? So, is that amazing? So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, he's a father of many nations. In what light he become a father of many nations? That's the supposition. And the substance comes, am I right? Mm -hmm. he, why he was positioned or equipped to be a father of many nations? Because there's certain justice, certain wisdom, a counsel want him to be the source of it, the channel of it. Making sense here, you know, so. Is that amazing? Again, is a man divine justice, as we shared in the time briefers I shared with you. You know, when Solomon asked God certain kind of wisdom, it's not just any wisdom, am I right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a certain wisdom to manage his people, you know, to shepherd his people. And with that, we can call the kingly wisdom for sure. That's kingly wisdom. So, uh, and Solomon was typified in that way as a, a fulfillment of a certain kind of song, right? So, in God's yeah. setup, set up. to prototype through Christ Jesus is the song she would have met. 
So Sanshi, without this kind of wisdom, can you do anything? So when Jesus come on board, said, I have better, uh, better wisdom than Solomon. What he mean? Not as man thinking, right? So the information age, you know, so it end. Or scientific knowledge. It's God's righteous rule, God's righteous justice being made out. So mm -hmm. that is why Abraham was a father to many nations. That's why David, then after that Solomon, become king of God's heart, am I, or God's delight. Especially in the case when Solomon quests for wisdom, am I, as a young, young king. So, yeah. so when Jesus said, I have better wisdom than Solomon's, is that not what we're talking about? It's the same wing of definition, in a sense. You know, basically I have the king of kings wisdom, am I, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Asian one long to see it. What are they saying? What are they talking about? Moses was a lawgiver and a judge to the nations. Abraham was head of the horse, father of many nations. Then come to David, who was a fulfillment in a certain light, a prefigure, if you will, of Jesus Christ as the son of Moses' law. And the promise, the covenant of Abraham, a son of that covenant, son is a sea of fulfillment, something, am I? So, so what he fulfilled, in a sense, in David, David was a king, you know, Solomon was a king, am I? So, it's a governing wisdom, but not man justice, am I? Not man righteousness, so... So there you, you come back to the beginning, Genesis. I'll try to guide you to some thoughts reading the scripture differently, am I? So you can see this in the very beginning. Why the two trees? Knowledge of good and evil. That knowledge is more than just, oh, I, I got it. Intellectual grasp. That knowledge means the impartation of authority power with it. A whole economy of it, am I? So... There lies the whole management, the responsibility of managing the cosmos on the age of things how being governed. Make sense to you? So, with the full feature of uh, God's wisdom, God's justice, through His divine um, uh, enabling to know what is good as evil, man subscribes to another way, am I? So, to mend up justice for himself, in a sense. And that justice, the standard, the source, wisdom supporting it, was from the devil. That's why later on the Yuan become as a ruler of this world, am I? It's this cosmos. So it's a huge thing. My point in this light, what kind of argument of just at the side notes, not my point. <laughs> like a, Let's argue about all day long who is right with the free will or predestination. Does it help anybody in terms of prophesying this kind of wisdom or counsel? Are you getting any near it? <laughs> you know, so is that how you know the mind gone? How to enter into his ministry by those kind of arguments? Self made philosophical arguments. Self made things. Am I right? so? It's like a why you call this black, not white? You know, mm -hmm. I want to call it black. I want to call it white. Two schools argue each other. You know, so making sense to you. So, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to maybe exaggerate the topic a little bit. We have this uh, the logical problem. You learn philosophy will start with the logic and basic logic. So. In the ancient time, Chinese people don't actually fully embrace the basic logic yet. And certain people poke holes in the logic, you know, so this uh, literally become a school of thoughts because people know how they have property tongues, you know, to poke in the logic holes. Like the senators or congressmen today, perverted tongues, perverted minds, rather than greed and work on substantial and constructive and beneficial to everybody, am I? So, they poke each other's argument all day long. Anyway, you know that's eventually cause for downfall wrong, the Senate. They don't care about 
to the good anymore. They care about the poor others a lot. They're right. That's the big new common mainstay of preaching, preaching education and preaching whatever. Let, let me back to this Chinese guy before he lost his argument because the white horse is not a horse. Do you think about it? Why a white horse is not a horse? <laughs> he has a he has we prove it, you know. A wild horse is not a horse. It's not a horse. <laughs> you know. Because our idea of what a horse is is not specifically a white horse. Yeah. <laughs> we call it Bay Ma Pi Ma Lui, you know. So an argument about why wild horse is not a horse. And agree with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> agree with that kind of power argument or perversion. So let's poke everything and poke a hole. And prove that a white horse is not a horse, therefore you must be wrong. <laughs> but I can argue with you, you know, with the with the with wrong logical, wrong reasonings. But it's a common sense a wild horse is one of the horse and I have many horses. So because they can't think it, they get smart enough to prove with their arguments, with with the tongue, pray will with the tongue, the Bible for the the people want to pray will God with the tongue. It's, it's a simple thing. He said that's not a big problem, no no one, unfortunately. Let's see give any violation. The world of people who try to teach us wisdom or teach us good things, you know, eighty percent, ninety percent effort is used not in constructive thinking. It's either uh, what is called um, or false constructive thinking, you know. So the argument, I don't know when it started the free will participation, run down through the ages. Of Christianity literally be around again. So, you know, in the time, actually, just reading John Wesley, a good friend Wildfield, they used to partner together, you know, in the beginning, go to Americans, missionaries, very close friend. Later on, they become, they have a separate each other. They still remain friends, but they separate each other because they disagree with the free will and the one to this nation, you know, so. We're good people. You know, everyone like God, love God, and uh, want to, to serve God. But eventually, this kind of thing cause a separation. Now, why that? Why is that a separation? Because the framework to pick it up from the predestination confine them, not able to bring them free mode. That mode of thinking. Um, let's move on. However, my point is for you to learn to think the essence of a thing, right? So, not confined by secondary or imperfect framework thinking, right? So, man is so quick to, or easy to set it up, prove it, and then prove they are smart or they're better than others, rather than what? And uh, rather than learn, learn like Abraham did, Moses did, David did, learn true wisdom, making sense to you, you know, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> Point three. The friend of God has power with God. Let's stop there, actually. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to continue. This is basically a book for us English summer discussion on the Bible making sense to you so yeah mm -hmm.